You know what, if you're feeling weak and beaten up by life, if you're going through trials and tribulations, you came to the right place this morning because we have a God who knows your situation, a God who cares for you, and a God who is always there even when you're feeling weak. Can I get an amen on that? We're here to worship his name this morning, and so we're glad you are here. Uh, God reaches out to the brokenhearted and those that respond to him and works in wondrous ways, and so we're going to praise the Lord this morning. We're going to hear from his word uh, and uh, learn of him. Uh, But before we uh, get to our worship service this morning, we have a few announcements uh, just to help you connect with the church. We have a lot of things going on, entering a very busy month. You know, I say that like every month, though. I mean, it's like every month. Does it ever not get busy? But we want to have things for you guys to participate in that brings the body of Christ together, that encourages you and builds you up and gives you opportunities to serve. Uh, So with that, I mean, we have a couple of uh, trips that we want to let you know about and events here. First of all is uh, the Cornerstone Camping Trip. That's our uh, post-high school group that is, uh, you know, meeting uh, coming up, going to uh, the Jim Thorpe area. They're going to be doing some uh, some camping and some biking and some hiking and some relaxing and some coffee sipping and all kinds of fun things like that. It's going to be going on uh, there up at Jim Thorpe, just a chance for them to uh, to get away. If you're interested in uh, in attending that trip, again, you can see, uh, you know, John Bortz or Heather and Allen uh, for details about that trip. 
Uh, then also we have our men's golf outing, which is uh, uh, happening uh, here on the 8th uh, mean of October. Now, uh, Steve has uh, told me that we need a few more people to be able to, uh, to make this work. Uh, and uh, so if we don't get a couple more folks to sign up, we'll probably uh, put that off to the spring again. Um, so uh, again, we need about two to four more people to sign up for the men's uh, golf outing. And also on the same day in the morning, uh, we have uh, Pastor Nick is moving into his new home. So that's a, a good time of celebration there for him. Yeah, we can do a little uh, little thank you to the Lord for that. It's been a long time coming. So I've been... Uh, uh, Adam back there at the sound booth and others have been feverishly working on uh, that house and the roof and many people have been helping him with uh, getting that in order. So uh, I mean he's going to be uh, he's going to be moving and uh, there is a sign up for that I believe somewhere or a uh, 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 text Nick uh, uh, if uh, you're interested in coming and helping out with that. Many hands make light work and he's got a lot of junk I mean important items in the house to be able to move so uh, you can uh, see him afterwards if you're interested in coming and helping with that. Uh, October 11th, I mean, is I mean our singles ministry trip to Peddler's Village, uh, and also lunch at the Cock and Bull restaurant there. Uh, and uh, so our singles uh, ministry uh, uh, ministers to people who are uh, lifelong single or who are uh, widowed or divorced or just you know struggling in that area. I mean, of their life or just uh, you know wanting to get out and uh, uh, be around some folks. Uh, and so we are enjoying those trips. There is a sign up in the back for that. So please sign up. We would love to, uh, to see you out. We had a great time at our first event uh, up uh, at Goods and Yoders. And so we're going to be uh, uh, doing our second event here on, on the 11th. Uh, also, we have our Camp Inn. Remember what that is? That's uh, for families. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff for kids to do there that night. We've got all kinds of kids' games lined up for them. We've got our big inflatable that will be set up. Uh, we've got uh, all kinds of uh, you know, great food that night. Uh, an espresso bar, all kinds of stuff. If you are, uh, you know, I mean, just a, a, a person in the church and you, you know, you are, uh, uh, you know, older or whatever, or you don't uh, want to stay overnight, you don't have to. You can just come that evening for the meal. But one thing we do need you to do is we do need you to sign up because we have to purchase food for that. And so please, 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 if you are coming, uh, I mean, go back and sign up so we know how much food to have so we can prepare it for you so that it is ready. And by the way, the homemade French fries, oh boy, yeah, they're pretty wow. Uh, there's some good stuff out there, some funnel cake, all the cool fall food. So, you I mean, you're going to be uh, loving that. So sign up for the camp and great time of fellowship. Uh, and then for you, uh, for you men as well, I mean, we have our man camp coming up on the 21st through the 23rd. Uh, that's up at uh, uh, Ray Bortz's cabin, cabin, uh, you know, up near uh, Knobles Grove. Is that it or is it Nobles Grove? It's, can it, uh, it's it, you know, it's knife. You don't pronounce knife with the K, but uh, never mind. We won't get into all that right now. So, um, great time. What do the guys Pastor do up Jeff there on the Skull. cabin? Huh? What? Pastor Jeff Skull. Okay. Skull. Not sure that applies, but we'll get to it. Um, anyway, so uh, what do the guys do up there? We do all kinds of cool man stuff like shooting guns and... Uh, Hiking and um, eating like steak and like, you know, great food. And uh, if you just need to relax, like you're just like, you know what, I'm just tired, man. I want to go up there and take some naps and stuff like that. That's cool too, man. You can do that. So be around some other men. Uh, great times of devotion, fellowship. You mean wonderful conversations. Um, you mean there's all kinds of cool stuff to do. And disc golf. Did I mention disc golf? That's really cool to do. If you want to learn, you never played, you're a guy, come on up. Man camp, 21st through 23rd. You mean that's awesome. Uh, you need to take advantage of that. Great time just to get away and to uh, just uh, do men things. What? Sign up in the back. You can see Earl right there. You I mean, he will uh, probably be back there lurking um, so that uh, you can sign up for that. Uh, also, uh, two other things. Uh, Genesis uh, Women's Clinic has some needs, uh, and you can see them up there, on the, uh, up there on the screen for you. There is a box in the foyer uh, out there where you can drop those things uh, if you're interested in helping support that ministry, some things they need to be able to, uh, to give out to the ladies uh, that come in. Uh, and then also, uh, our last uh, announcement is that our uh, basketball uh, afternoon is uh, coming up next week. So next week is our, our basketball uh, afternoon at church here, our Sunday afternoon. We have a number of teams, uh, you know, divided up there. Uh, if you'd like to come out and be a part of that, you're interested in some sports types activities, uh, we'll be playing basketball, I mean, at the church after the morning service. Uh, I mean, so come out to that as well. Uh, and so with that, we'll turn it over to Nick for our worship this morning. Let's pray. Father, what a privilege it is to know you as Father. We are not eternal from eternity past, but you have made us into creatures who are redeemed and in new creation live forever with you, something that we don't deserve. Who are we but creatures of the dust that have offended God Almighty? 
But instead of condemning us in our sins with no way out, you saved us from them. And as the basis of our faith, may we never, never get over it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're new to Berean, welcome. I'm so happy to see new faces all the time here. And uh, one thing that we do here is we learn one song a month together. See, the Bible is very, very, very clear. It says, sing to him a new song. And it says it over and over and over again. So we have to follow the commands of God. And if you don't like it, then you've got to take it up with him. So I'm going to follow the Lord's command. He says, sing to him a new song, play skillfully, and make a loud noise. <clears throat> Psalm 33, 3. And never once in the Bible says, sing uh, only songs you've sung the, your whole life only and play really quietly and sing as quiet as possible. I haven't found that verse yet. So, but we, have to, but we try to keep up with all of them. And so every month we learn a song together, and I try to choose a song that will fit with whatever we're going to be preaching about for the next month. Because uh, I'm, I'm, we, we know ahead of time what passages we're going to be looking through because we preach, just, uh, we, we, we preach exegetically, so we know what, uh, whatever the next passages are going to be. So what is a common theme we have between all these passages? And it's very clear in these next couple passages in Luke that you have a Savior among you, and you do not realize it. You're waiting for the Messiah. He is in your presence in Israel, and you do not accept it. You reject him. You argue against him. And in your flesh, you deny him. May that not be the case for us. Recognize the Savior is with you. You need, need not go anywhere else. Salvation comes by one name alone, and that is the King, Jesus Christ. So this is the song we're going to learn together this month. And uh, if you know it already, you can sing along, but most of you probably don't, so you just want to listen and learn. Uh, that's great. Every heart is 
Our scripture today comes from Luke chapter 19. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying "Would you, that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. They will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. What a terrible, awful passage that those things came to pass. But that's what happens when we lose sight. We stop putting our gaze on God alone. And we choose worldliness and idolatry over him. So would you please stand as we sing our final song, Behold Our God. We fix our eyes on the one who saves us, God Almighty.
Father. We come to you as humble servants. The greatest title you can give us is your servant. If you're reading the book of Joshua, you told your servant Joshua, you know that the Lord's servant Moses has died. What greater title can we get? Teach us to be servants who recognize the King, the Savior, is among us. And it is ours to love and serve him. And we will do that by loving and serving each other. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Behold our God. I'm going to try to behold him in the scriptures this morning. Before we do that, I do have uh, one thing I want to note. Probably our elder stateswoman is here this morning with us. She's still is residing at the nursery home, but she's able to have, she had a day pass today. All the way in the back, very last row, right by those back doors, is Susan Benyaski. Susan, you wave to us. There she is. Susan's been here at Berean Bible Church since the very beginning. She's one of the few that's been here longer than I have. Uh, been a, a prayer warrior. Her husband was on the boards, uh, the founding boards of Berean Bible Church. And she continues to pray for us. Uh, she's making great progress. I was down to see her about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, and she walked for me. Uh, they had the therapist, and she said, you got to walk all the way down the hall to Pastor Jace. And uh, she made it. She made it. And so I don't know uh, if there's a plan on how soon she might be able to return home. But either way, uh, she's serving the Lord in a building that used to be her high school, but is now... A retirement center. So uh, what a great thing down there in uh, Schwenk. So pray for her and make sure you greet her, uh, those of you who have known her for many, many years. Uh, we uh, have often uh, have events come into our life and we think it's going to come out one way and it comes out very, very differently. You know, we anticipate uh, people being happy with something we did. It turns out to be sad. We anticipate people being sad and they're happy about it. Uh, and here we have this uh, Wonderful, wonderful story if you want to turn to Luke chapter 19. We're just going to be a couple verses today. Uh, uh, we're going to deal with verses uh, 41 through 44 of Luke chapter 19. The reason why we're skipping over verses 28 uh, through 40 are because, if you remember, back at uh, Palm Sunday in April, Pastor Jeff preached this passage. So we're going to jump ahead, and then when we get to it, we'll kind of skip over it. And that is the story of uh, the... Uh, triumphal entry. I'll just read a couple verses there to get you into the context. Uh, it says, as he was uh, going to enter into Jerusalem, and of course, he's riding upon his donkey, and uh, they're casting the palms, branches in the way. They're shouting for him. Uh, it says, and as uh, I'm beginning in uh, verse 36, and as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. This is a day of jubilation. It's a party. It's a parade. And the only ones who are not happy about it, it seemed, at least on the surface, were the Pharisees, many of them. And they were upset because the people were reciting a messianic psalm. And in fact, giving Jesus uh, the title of the Messiah which he was, which he rightly owned. But it wasn't so much for triumphal entry, we know, in the sense that, yes, it was surface-wise, but we know what's coming. Because we have the ability to look back on what happens in this last week. But people were excited. The buzz that Jesus had created was at fever pitch. People had seen the miracles. They had heard his teaching. And now they're proclaiming him as Messiah, we just read there. In Psalm 8, uh, 118, 26, this is what they were quoting. It's a messianic psalm. It's a psalm that's written 
about, uh, in prophecy about the Messiah who would come. And there in that 118th Psalm, it said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. And so the people were at fever pitch. And you have this in, incredible scene that is, that is taking place. Matthew, it says that they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, son of David. That's what Hosanna means, save us. Save us, son of David. So you have this incredible scene. This whole entire uh, procession is descending down from the Mount of Olives. They're shouting. There's dancing. Emotions are at a fever pitch. And they come to this descent on Mount of Olives, which would have been like an overlook. You could see the whole city laid out before you. And in the midst of all of that joy, in the midst of all of that jubilation, in the midst of that great party, what happens? Jesus stops and he cries. You talk about something being out of place. I, I wonder what they would have thought. Here we are heralding him. Here we are rejoicing in him. And, and he stops and, and he's crying. There's an interesting word here for, for crying. Back in John chapter 11, we have the story of Lazarus and the raising of Lazarus, and it says, there you have the shortest verse in the Bible. I think it's verse 35, isn't it? 1135. It says, Jesus wept. He went to the tomb of Lazarus, and he wept. He knew he was going to raise him. Why would he weep? Because of what death did to people. But it's a different word for crying there. There, the, the word is... It's Dakruo. He was crying over physical death. It was a word used for a quiet expression of grief. Kind of meant like, there he shed a tear at the tomb. But here, it says that Jesus, Kleio, which is a word which means deep agony, a loud expression of grief. Jesus doesn't come here and shed a tear. This is the chest heaving, sobbing. Not because he's going to suffer and die, which he knew. Remember that. He knew all along. He steadfastly set his, his uh, face upon Jerusalem. He said, it's time to go. It's time for me to go up. It's time for me to be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles. It's time for me to go to the cross. They didn't understand it. He knew that it was his time to suffer and die, but he's not sobbing over that. He's lamenting over the lost. He's lamenting over their hardened hearts. This same word, Clio, is used in Mark chapter 5 and verse 38. The hearing, uh, the healing or the raising from the dead of Jairus' daughter. It says, they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, and people were weeping and wailing loudly. They were chaos. They were out of control. Their emotions. It's the same word that's also used in Matthew chapter 26. I don't think that's the right verse that I'm looking for. But after Jesus, after uh, Peter denies the Lord, it says that he goes out, and what does he do? He denies him three times. He goes out and he weeps, what? Bitterly. Sobbing. Losing control. And here you see the heart of our king. Here you see the heart of the one that we worship this morning, how truly kingly to show his love and his sorrow over sin, even while shouts of triumph are echoing in, in, in his ears. Truly, Jerusalem has never seen a more fit king, have they? All the kings that have been coronated in the nation of Israel, all that have walked through their streets, here is the greatest king 
that they will ever see. And yet, in less than a week's time, they will be shouting out, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. The fickleness of their hearts. And he sobs over this guilty city where in just a few short days, the greatest injustice in the history of the entire universe is going to play out. That they should deny their king. That he should be put to death on the cross of Calvary. And so even in the midst of that cry of coronation, Jesus is sobbing for them, filled with compassion, filled with love, filled with the sorrow that they have turned to their own ways. And he composes himself after he sobs and he says to them, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. From a, a cry of coronation to a cry of condemnation. He looks over the city, Jerusalem, which means the city of peace or the city of foundation. The city of the foundation of peace. And of course, as he speaks to Jerusalem, he's speaking uh, that represents the whole entire nation. So this is the first time that he's lamented over Israel and, in fact, over the city, which, by the way, folks, is still the center of the universe. Always keep your eyes on Jerusalem. History is attached to Jerusalem. All things will culminate in Jerusalem. Never forget that. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus said this about them. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He repeats it twice. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. These things are going to be hidden from them. You mouth it now. They're mouthing it now at the triumphal entry. But he says, you're never going to know me till you say this with meaning. And that doesn't come until the end of the tribulational period. Until there's a national repentance from the Jewish people. Oh, they were hoping for peace. They were shouting, remember, what did they expect? The Messiah do come in and deliver them from the Romans and set up his kingdom immediately. Even his disciples still believe that. We've been talking about that. And so as Jesus enters into Jerusalem, they're hoping for peace. The people are hoping for peace. But what does Jesus see? He sees war and suffering and destruction ahead. Why? Because of their wasted opportunities. Because they have not truly received him. I look at the heart of the Lord Jesus. Oh, how different it is from the heart of Jonah, right? When Jonah went to the city of Nineveh, what did he want? He wanted it destroyed. He was upset. He said, I know the Lord's going to Lord's gonna be gracious to this city. I don't want him destroyed. Jonah wanted destruction. Jesus looked on Jerusalem. He knew what they were going to do to him. You see his love? He looked upon Jerusalem and he wept for them. He sobbed for them. Why? Because they were going to destroy and were destroying themselves. Because they turned away. 
because they wasted their opportunities. And I know the skeptics out there. They say, you know, that's wonderful. Jesus, why didn't Jesus do something? If, if, if God is so concerned about the world and all the suffering and all the pain and all the sorrow, why doesn't he do something? You know the answer to that, don't you? He did do something. That's what Jesus is going to do. He wept, and then he went, and he took action. He was so moved by this, he would take action. He would go to the cross. Remember, nobody put him there. He went of his own accord. He could have stopped them at any time. Jesus was not weeping because he was going to suffer and die. No, he was lamenting the loss in their hard hearts. I like the way it puts it in the Bible exposition commentary. It says, no matter where Jesus looked, he found cause for weeping. If he looked back, he saw how the nation had wasted opportunities. If he looked within, he saw spiritual ignorance and blindness as he looked around at the people. Jesus saw religious activity that accomplished very little. As Jesus looked ahead, he wept as he saw the terrible judgment that was coming to the nation, to the city, and the temple. I wonder how much Jesus weeps for us now. I wonder if he weeps for our nation in heaven. I wonder if he's weeping for the world in heaven right now because of the missed opportunities. I believe he is, don't you? He did something. He went to the cross of Calvary. And so we preach a Savior of infinite love. But we also must preach a Savior of infinite just, uh, inf infinitely just and infinite justice. And if he spares not his own people, if he spares not the holy city, what shall become to the rest of us? Look again what he says there in Luke chapter 19. Would that you, even you, and I'll put in the translation, if you had known on this day the things that make for peace. If you had known. It's a second class conditional in the Greek, which means if you can, you should, but you won't. You don't know it, but you ought to know it. And he says if it was on this day, on this specific, unique day, somebody asks, well, how could these Jewish people know? How could they know that this was their Messiah? I'll tell you how they could know by the Scriptures by having a literal interpretation of the Old Testament prophecies, which we have walked away in our own uh, time. We've walked away from it, by the way. Even many who call themselves Christians have abandoned a liberal, uh, literal interpretation of the Scriptures. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. We don't have time to get into all of this. I'm sure we will as we go forward. Once we're done with Luke, we may very well do some prophecy, maybe we'll wind up in the book of Revelation. But in order to do Revelation, you have to do at least the prophetic parts of Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 9, it says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for, in, for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one of a prince. Who's that? The Messiah. There shall be seven weeks, then 62 more weeks, 70 weeks to the decree of Artaxerxes, which took place in history to rebuild the temple, totaling 62 uh, weeks. It comes up to, you know, there are 70 weeks. It comes to 69 weeks. And I could go back and uh, do all, uh, all of this, which would take us several 
things, but Daniel prophesied 483 years before Messiah would come. We know exactly when the decree went forth. We know that there were 62 more weeks in there. A man by the name of Sir Robert Anderson did all this work with the Hebrew calendar and stuff like that, so that the very day that it says, this day you should have known, because it gives the, to the very single day, to April 6th, 32 AD, that was Palm Sunday. These people knew the Messianic prophecies. They knew Daniel. They should have known that this was the day. As a matter of fact, because of this work, you can take the time to look him up. Sir Robert Anderson, he wrote a whole book on this, that there are a number of Jewish people that have come to know Christ, the founders of Jews for Jesus, the founder of chosen people, got saved as rabbis and as Jewish people because of this teaching right here. You should have known this day. Instead of looking forward, as many Jews today do, when's our Messiah coming? Where is he at? They needed to look backward. They missed him. It was hidden from them. This is now hidden from you because you have wasted the opportunity. This is the time. Yes, there was a believing remnant that recognized him. There is still a believing remnant that recognized him, but most of the Jewish people denied him. Most of them will say, crucify him. Most of him will go with the flow of the crowd and walk away. But if you study the Scriptures, you'll know what it says. His timing was there. Daniel 9, verses 24 to 7. His manner of coming was prophesied. Zechariah 9, verse 9. It says, Rejoice, O greatly, of O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He did that, didn't he? Literally. In April of 32 AD, he said, these are the things which make for your peace. Not the political peace that you're looking for, but eternal peace, spiritual peace, genuine, eternal peace was to be yours. Why? Because he was the Prince of Peace. He's bringing it himself. And he came at the time appointed for him. Adrian Rogers used to say, Jesus came on time, he died on time, he was buried on time, he arose on time, and he's coming on time. That's pretty good stuff, isn't it? He said, you can bank on that. And I'm telling you, you can bank on that. It's sure to take place because Jesus is always on time. But these people weren't ready. Jesus said, now it is hidden from you. Because they wouldn't see it, they couldn't see it. He said, the curtain is falling on you. Now it's hidden. The word is crypto. You know the English word we get from that? Cryptic. It's cryptic to you. It's hidden from you. You can't see it. It's concealed from you. Until when? Until you're ready to receive him. Once again, we're back to that literal thing where God is not done with the nation of Israel. I need to take you to Romans chapter 11 and say to those people who spiritualize everything regarding the nation of Israel and say it belongs to the church, explain this to me, please. Romans chapter 11, verse 27. Well, I'm going to start in 26 to give a little context. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Paul's talking about Israel in the future. He says, Israel nation will have salvation. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, from Israel. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. 
Paul's saying right now they're enemies of God, but they're going to be delivered. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. The promises made to Israel must be fulfilled. We keep telling you that, keep believing that, because out there in the world, even those who are brothers in Christ, many of them are shooting at this complaining. I say, no, all of those things have been spiritualized and belong to the church, and they do not. In principle, you could say, yes, there's an application to us. That these people couldn't believe because it was hidden from them. And we run the same exact risk, having great opportunities. At a time it should have been a universal cry of coronation, they are receiving a cry of condemnation. And oh, how difficult it is. It's a cry of desolation as well. Look at what uh, chapter 19, verse 43 says. For the days will come to you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. When was your visitation? Right now. The ministry of Christ, the day of Christ, he's presented to them. And that presentation to them was real and genuine. If they would have received him, I'm not sure how God would have worked it out, but he would have worked it out. But the kingdom was delayed because they turned away from him. And he says, because of that, a siege is coming upon you. And a siege is becoming upon Jerusalem. He said, they're going to throw up a barricade around you. A fortified fence. You know, they literally did that to Jerusalem in 70 AD when the Roman general Titus came to squash a Jewish rebellion. The city was under siege for 143 days. Relations between the Romans and uh, their army and the Jewish be people deteriorated to such a point that by the time the city was taken, the Romans, under the Roman command, the army there couldn't even be controlled. They had such a hatred for the Jews. 143 days. They threw up a barricade. They put up a fence. You know, think of that picket, the, the, almost like the old forts, you know. They put up timbers. Nobody's getting away. They hemmed them in. As we said, they'll throw up a barricade against you. We don't even want one of them to get away. The Jews tried to make a break out during that 143 days, actually broke through. And the Romans repaired the barricade with mortar and stone, something that should have taken them a month, they did almost overnight. They were so infuriated against them till the city fell, it was completely destroyed. The temple was torn down, just as Jesus said it would be. So you won't find two stones standing upon one another. According to historical accounts, up to a million Jewish people died, and thousands were taken captive. Josephus writes about it as a Jewish historian in the Jewish wars. I'll read an excerpt of it for for it says, in the morning, Titus commanded that the fire should be put out. They had set some fires into the temple and some skirmishes. Titus and the Roman leadership didn't want the temple to be destroyed. It said there a road had been built to the gates to allow entry for his troops. His generals then came together to discuss what should be done with the temple. Some wanted to destroy it because it would give the Jews a, uh, because it would give the Jews a reason for uprisings. Others argued that if the Jews would clear out of the temple, it should be allowed to stand. But if they were to use it as a fortress, it should be destroyed. Titus then gave the command that no matter what happened, the temple should be spared because it would always be a great tribute to the empire. Three of his chief generals agreed, and the meeting was disbanded. Titus then went into Antonia, 
which was a fortress there, intending the next morning to attack and overwhelm the temple with his entire force. But on that day, August 30th, 70 AD, the same day on which Solomon's temple had been destroyed by the king of Babylon, the structure was doomed. For the rebels attacked the Romans after Titus had withdrawn, and a battle took place between the temple guards and the Roman troops who were trying to put out the flames in the inner courts. The, the troops were trying to put out the flames to save the temple. The Romans scattered the Jews and pursued them into the sanctuary. At the same time, a soldier recklessly grabbed the torch. He hurled the fire stick through the doors made of gold on the north side, which allowed entry to chambers around the sanctuary. On seeing the flames, a cry went up from the Jews, and caring nothing for their lives, they rushed forward to put out the fire in the inner sanctuary. A messenger rushed to the tent of Titus to inform him of the fire. Immediately, Titus ran to the temple to put out the flames. But because of the battle that raged on, the soldiers either could not or would not hear his commands. The wrath of his troops could not be stopped. And at the doorway, many soldiers were trampled by their own forces. There among the burning ruins they fell, sharing the same fate as their enemies. Pretending not to hear the commands of their general and filled with hatred, the soldiers rushed on, hurling their torches into the temple. The helpless rebels made no attempt at defense. Fleeing for their lives with bloodshed all around, many civilians were caught in the battle. Even the steps of the altar were stained with the blood of the dead. When Caesar could not hold back his troops, he and his generals entered the temple and viewed for the last time the most holy place, since the fire had not yet reached the inside, but was still feeding the outside chambers. Titus made one last effort to save the structure, ordering a centurion to club anyone if they disobeyed his commands. He rushed forward and pleaded with his soldiers to put out the flames, but because of their hatred of the Jews and their desire for riches, the soldiers disregarded the orders of their general. Seeing that all the surroundings were made of gold, they assumed that inside there would be even greater treasures. Titus then ran out to hold back his troops, but one of those who had entered with him thrust a torch into the hinges of the tem temple gate and mighty fire, <laughs> mighty fire shot up inside. Caesar and his generals fled for safety, and thus, against his wishes, the sanctuary was burned. The city and the temple was then leveled to the ground by the command of Caesar. Only the highest towers and part of the western wall remained to show all mankind how the Romans overpowered such a strong fortress. If you read in other parts, you see how they went in there and they pried apart all the stones because in the fire, the gold was melting and running into the cracks. And they did that so they could loot the place more effectively. And they wiped her clean. Jesus told them, this is what will happen to your city because you do not know the time of your visitation. It's such a sad thing to see how people can neglect the gift of salvation, the teaching of the Lord Jesus, his miracles. They rejected the testimony of their own scriptures to him. They had refused the powerful testimony of his miracles. They refused the moral perfection of his lives, the power and authority of his words, which all of them felt. Remember, many of them, we've never heard a man speak like this. Willfully, they had shut their eyes, even as Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Put up there in verse 14. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all of mankind. To oppose Jesus Christ is to oppose all of mankind. He is the answer to the needs of all of mankind. By hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, 
so as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. The compassionate Christ, who is also infinitely just, they did not see the time of their visitation and they paid the consequences. There's a time of visitation for America. There's a time of visitation for the world. We've had the word of God. We get to look backward. And yet, our nation as a whole is rejecting Christ. The world as a whole is rejecting Christ. And I'm going to tell you, when you reject Christ, what happens? Calamity follows. They're rejecting him as their savior. They're rejecting him as their, as their king. And if you reject Jesus as your savior and king, you will face him as your judge. Are we better than Israel? Are we better than the Jewish people? Psalm 48 goes like this, the first three verses anyway. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in his holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation. This is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion, in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. The greatest city in the world. The cities from which the Lord Jesus will rule and reign, he did not spare it in 70 AD. He will not spare mankind. He will not spare America. He will not spare the world if they reject Christ. If you reject Christ, you will pay the consequences. And they will be far worse than what happened in 70 AD. They will be far worse than what has befallen Florida and some of the southern states with Hurricane Ian this week. You know, we hear that. Oh, man, lives lost, property, billions of dollars. It's nothing compared to losing your soul. Losing the soul of a nation, losing the soul of the world. So I ask again this morning, do you think that the Lord Jesus weeps for our nation now? Do you think the Lord Jesus weeps for the world now? You know what I say to you? As Jesus said to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, oh, little chicks, flee and hide under the wings of the eternal King and Savior. Because as surely as he loves you, judgment comes, and it falls upon all those who reject him. Why should you perish when life has been provided? It's there for you. Receive Christ as your Savior. You know you're a sinner. You can be religious and totally lost. You can sing Christian songs and be totally lost. These people sang. They quoted Scripture. And Jesus said you're falling into judgment. Why? Because their heart wasn't in it. And it proved itself very quickly that their heart wasn't in it. Their life that went forward, they rejected him. They lived for themselves. And many in America today, even outward, before it would be like, well, America's a story of a Christian nation. And yet all you hear every day is, no, no, no. Most of the people out there that at once would say, yes, I'm a Christian, maybe not practicing my Christian now, say absolutely not. Do we have the heart like Jesus has for the world? Do we sob for them? Do we lament that they know not Christ? And do they not know Christ because we're not telling them? Because we do not have a burden for them? Because we do not want to offend them? Because we don't want to upset people? The hour is late. Brothers and sisters,
Judgment has already begun to fall in this country, I think. Don't you not? I don't think it's too late for this country. But there are people leaving this realm of time, even as we stand here today, even as we preach, even as we worship, even as we sing, and it's too late for them. Let's remember the one who gave himself for us, and let's remember that we have the message of life, everlasting life. Flee, run, little chicks, under the wings of our eternal Savior and King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. And we know that you are a loving and compassionate God. But we know that you're also righteous and just in all of your doings. And we know that your compassion and your love moved you to send your Son to be our Savior, to do something about the terrible plight of mankind. Father, you've given us free will. I'm going to pray, Father, that those of us who know you would have a burden, a heart, godly sorrow for those who do not know you. Father, we know there's another day coming. A day of judgment. A day of wrath. Yes! a day when there literally will be a kingdom of God on earth. And those who know you will be part of it, will rule and reign with you. But Father, help us to labor here while it is yet day, to labor for our King and our Savior, to be, as Nick said, the greatest thing in the world, to be servants and slaves of the Most High. And we thank you for it, praise you for it, in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we observe the Lord's table, would you please stand as we read a passage for communion coming from Luke chapter 22. And when the hour came, he reclined to the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Please sing together. Jesus do something about it? We heard this morning he did. We're moving into that part of the passion of his week. He went to the cross. He died in our place. He rose again. He's ascended. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And he said, those of you who know me, those of you who see me as their Savior and their King should remember what I have done for you until 
I come again. We're about to go into our to the table of the Lord. If you knew or didn't get a cup with a wafer on top of it and you do know Christ is your Savior and would like to partake of communion, slip your hand up. I'll make sure that someone gets around with them. Anybody here? We have one, some down front. There are some people. We need some people to go through. Uh, here and down that center aisle over here, Caleb. Um, on the far aisle there, there's several that need communion. Anybody else? Get your hand up so you can see them. There's some over here on this side too. If someone can grab some there. We need to remember the one who gave himself. Is that Ben? Or over here we need on this side then. We're going to remember the one who gave us eternal life. Because without him, we couldn't be good enough. There's nothing we could do to earn our salvation or merit it. Only through the merits and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to give you a few moments to prepare your hearts. Set aside all the other stuff. Forget about the ball game. Forget about what you're having for lunch. And focus on the one who gave himself for us. Yes, he did it for you but he did it for all of us and we're in fellowship underneath the headship of Christ for the bride of Christ, we're his servants, we're his people, we're joint heirs, all because of what Christ did for us. Amen? Let's remember him. Let's prepare our hearts so we can receive the elements with the right heart and the right attitude this morning. Let's pray. may continue to examine your hearts as we sing the second verse. the scriptures tell us that in the night in which the Lord Jesus was betrayed that he took the bread he blessed it and broke it and he passed it out to his disciples and he said take eat this is my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me now just before we partake of this wafer which is the emblem of of the body of the Lord Jesus given up for us that day on the cross of Calvary. Let's thank him together by saying, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your body, which was given for me. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your body, which was given for me. Now, as you partake, remember your Savior.
Then after he supped, the scripture said the Lord Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as you do eat the bread and drink the cup, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes. Now, just before we partake of the cup, which is the emblem of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus, let's once again thank him by saying, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blood, which was shed for me. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blood, which was shed for me. Now, once again, remember your Savior. called a slave of Christ recognize his visitation if so would you please stand as we sing our final verse would you do service for Jesus your salvation that came to us at such a price, but for us it is free. That the only thing we bring to our salvation is the sin that made it necessary. Move in the hearts of those today who have now understood and accept the fact that the time of visitation is here. That, you're, that you would move in them, that your Holy Spirit would move in them to receive the free gift of salvation that can be added to that number of saints who we were brought to yourself in the last day. May we be, continue to be motivated in our mission of reconciliation to the world, understanding that there are those who know you and those who don't know you yet, and that's where we want to see them. Give us the courage, the boldness to be able to present your gospel. Recognize that we don't need to be ashamed of it, for it is the power of salvation to all who believe. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and bring you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace.